thank you very much. Uh, and thank you to everybody at Ross Institute for inviting me to this very impressive and wonderful uh, workshop. So the lecture I will give is about how can we educate young children to sustainability. And I don't know exactly how it has to be done, but uh, um, I will try to explain how we do it in uh, La Main à la Pâte. I will say a few words about what is La Main à la Pâte and what does it mean uh, exactly. Uh, so uh, during uh, this lecture, I will talk about uh, education uh, to sustainable uh, development, and we will see that it's a very recent concern. Uh, I will speak uh, a little bit of what we have already heard about uh, during this week. I mean, the importance of emotional uh, and also of rational aspects. Uh, and so we'll focus on the, the links between science education, which is uh, um, indeed the, the, the first mission of La Malapat Foundation. It's not sustainability, it's science education. So we'll, we'll explore the link between science education and inquiry-based, uh, kind of an inquiry-based uh, education for sustainability. And I will show you a detailed example of one project for primary and lower secondary school. Uh, and a few, few other examples. So, so why to educate students uh, to sus for sustainable development? The, the question seems to be trivial, uh, and the answer seems to be obvious, but uh, indeed it's not, uh, it's, it's not as obvious uh, as it appears. Uh, indeed, uh, educational uh, institution may, uh, a lot of them exist for centuries, but the question of uh, sustainability and sustainable uh, development education is very recent. Um, I mean, uh, at first it was environmental education, but it began only uh, 20 or 30 years ago, not for centuries. So why now and not before? Uh, I show you the, this picture, uh, but uh, if you remember where at the beginning of the week, Pierre Lena already showed this picture, which is a very, very famous picture. It's one of the the most uh, replicated and diffuse, um, uh, with the most massive diffusion picture uh, ever taken. So, of course, we have seen during this week that there, there have been a great historical and cultural uh, diversity in uh, our relation to nature. But uh, we can consider that environmentalism has really emerged in the 70s. And so the question is why? why what's special? And this photo illustrates uh, a fundamental change in our view to, to think and to see our planet. Um, from, from 50 years, basically, uh, space exploration has enabled us for the first time in humanity uh, to see the Earth from outside. And what we have seen, what we see in this picture, we don't see any country or boundary. Or, and we see the Earth as a wall, uh, without any any boundary. Uh, a, we see a small planet. It's not as big as we think where we are on the ground. We see a small planet hidden somewhere in the in the dark, huge and cold uh, universe. So it's like a little uh, oasis, if you want. This kind of representation may have. Had uh, have had a, a significant impact on the way we think uh, our planet. And from our perspective on, on the ground, it's really difficult to imagine that a single species, let's say human species, uh, can have a significant impact on the Earth because it's so huge. If it's an infinitely uh, large planet, you can pollute as much as we all, you want because everything will be infinitely uh, diluted. But this kind of picture and other discoveries at the, the meantime help us to consider the, the planet not as big, but as a small uh, planet. So uh, actually, the, in the, the, the Life magazine, Life 100 photograph uh, that changed the world, uh, this picture has been considered as the most influential environmental uh, photograph ever taken. So we have seen this morning very beautiful uh, pictures too. So Another picture, so you see uh, astronomers like to speak about astronomy e e even when there is nothing. 
in common with the, with the, the topic. So, uh, astronomy and space exploration, of course, are, are, have had a strong impact on our perception, but they are not alone. Uh, anthropology, for example, we have seen it uh, during this week, the, the quest of the origin of humanities, uh, the understanding of this uh, origin and, and evolution, and even uh, discoveries in earth science like uh, plate, uh, plate tectonics, for example, showed us a planet uh, which is not uh, huge and static and uh, eternal uh, planet, but something that is small, active, complex, and fragile. And this is completely new in our perception of the planet. Now, today, uh, the, 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 the focus is made on a complex system like uh, atmosphere, for example, uh, through the, the problems of uh, climate change or previously ozone layer. And much more recently, we just try to, we just begin to understand and to feel a little bit the complexity, the importance, and the fragility of the oceans, for example, for the global equilibrium of the Earth. So, it, th this kind of discoveries, approximately at the same time, have changed our perception of the world. And by the meantime, uh, the global population has experienced an unprecedented growth during the 20th century. Uh, you can see on this picture that it took dozens of thousands of years uh, for humanity to reach one billion people. And it took on, only less than two centuries for passing from one billion to seven billion people. And we think now that in, within the, the 40 next year, which is nothing compared to the history of uh, humanity, within the 14 year, next year, we will reach uh, nine and a half billion people. So, uh, of course, this uh, explosion of demography has something to do with sustainability. Uh, this is something that is, to my opinion, fundamental to keep in mind when we are educating children, because very often um, we tend to make them feel guilty about what happened today. And it is fundamental for them to know that we don't have to blame the new generation. Uh, we are not behaving uh, differently as our father or grandfather, and we are, we are not less virtuous as our ancestors, but we are by far more numerous. So the, less, the, the same behavior who was sustainable two or three or four centuries ago is not, is just now uh, became suddenly unsustainable and problematic. Uh, as far as I know, and there is the, uh, the, the, the people, the, the man who has uh, summarized with uh, the most accuracy and, uh, and concision uh, what is uh, sustainable uh, development uh, and problematic is uh, Jacques Weber. Jacques Weber is a uh, biologist, anthropologist, and uh, economist. Uh, he said, so I will read, our generation is the first to be aware of its impact on nature, and the last one to still have the opportunity to reverse the situation. And uh, the important words here in the, the sentence uh, I underline uh, are, are, to my opinion, aware and reverse. Aware because uh, the consciousness of people is very essential. And this is why education, even from the earliest age, has an important role, a key role to play. Uh, the important world also is to reverse, because awareness is completely useless if it doesn't lead into action. Uh, so education for sustainable development should provide conceptual tools uh, to get a clear understanding on the problem, at, on, on the problem we are facing now. Um, so science will play a key role. But this is not uh, for the scientific community to decide what we have to do. The uh, scientific community is here to see, to say, okay, there are some problems. Uh, we can quantify, we can make a simulation on what will happen if we act this, this way or this way. But the choices our societies and uh, individuals have to make uh, have to be made 
driven by ethics, moral, or politics. And these are political issues, and scientists are not here to decide uh, uh, instead of the citizens. So our role here is not to make pupils, students, become ecological activists. It's not our purpose. Our purpose is to help them to become citizens. And as good citizens, I mean, as well informed, as well enlightened by science, for example, but by culture, by history, uh, and so on. So we, we have to help them to become citizens uh, as informed and as responsibility, uh, responsible sorry, uh, as possible. So in this sense, science education uh, must necessarily be based on science. Sorry, education for sustainable development is necessarily uh, based on science, but it cannot be reduced to science education. It has to include ethics uh, and civic dimensions. Uh, sustainable development has been defined. Uh, here we, we've got the definition uh, made by the UN uh, uh, 20 uh, a little bit more years ago, uh, as a way for the present generation to meet their needs without uh, compromising the ability of the next, next generation uh, to meet their own needs. So it's something that is completely centered around us. I mean, sustainability in this definition is anthropocentric. Right? And, uh, the education for sustainable development is something very new. The idea of environmentalism is new, but sustainable de development is new here. Is new here. Uh, the difference, because before we, we used to speak about environmental education, not education for sustainable development. There is a difference. Uh, the, the idea of protecting the environment is also central in sustainable development education, but it cannot be considered alone. Uh, we cannot, we, we cannot uh, consider the environment without considering the economics, for example, or the social issues. And we have had a very wonderful lecture yesterday about uh, refugees, who show it very well, the social impact uh, of an environmental issue that is glo uh, global warming, climate change, if you prefer. So, and to my opinion, it's a regret, uh, even in La Malapad project, but very often, sustainable development projects for school are focusing on environmental issues, but economics and, and social issue, uh, economical and social issues are very often bypassed, or very quickly, uh, if they are not. So, of course, we can, we can study economics through environmental uh, issues. For example, if we are interested in uh, climate change, uh, we, can, we can study uh, Nicolas Stern reports uh, about the cost of the climate change. And uh, what these economists tell us is that uh, if we want to limit the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere it, it, around uh, approximately 500 ppm, it will have a huge cost. I mean, uh, the order of magnitude is 1% of GPD, 1% of the global GPD each year during the, let's say, the next uh, uh, 30 or 40 years. So it's, it's enormous. The cost of limiting climate change is enormous. But Stearns uh, says also that, okay, action is costly, but not to act today will lead uh, in a few generations, in 40 years, in 50 years, to an enormous cost, which is by far uh, greater than the cost today. So the evaluation is to act today is 1% of GPD and not to act will lead to a, a, a decrease of the global GPD of 5% in the, in the next uh, decades. So this is a way, for example, to, in, to include uh, economy in sustainable development project, but I think we can, we can do more. Um, and we, 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 could, we could offer uh, even at lower secondary level, maybe not at primary school, but even at the very first grades of the secondary school, um, educational programs that are completely focused around economical and social issues. Uh, for example, we can study uh, inequalities around the world. Uh, this uh, 
this picture uh, show you the, the, the evolution of the, the world uh, capital uh, and simulation. This is a central simulation for the next uh, decade and for, until the end of the, of the century. We can see, for example, that um, in, in 40 years, in 2050, uh, Africa, uh, we know that Africa uh, population will double during this time and uh, will reach approximately uh, 2 billion people. But uh, Africa will still remain uh, by far, by far the poorest continent uh, in the world. And it's not obvious that population will accept it. Uh, one quarter of the population with only one tenth or maybe a little less uh, of uh, the capital. So it's not sustainable. And I'm not so optimistic about that. And I fear that it can lead to violence inside Africa, of course, but also uh, outside Africa, especially in Europe. So to my opinion, this situation is not sustainable and we, we could study it at school, but basically we are not. Uh, when we are doing uh, sustainable development projects, we are doing, dealing about um, biodiversity, waste and so on, but not this kind of problem. And we should do, I think. Uh, we could also uh, focus on our own inequalities. I mean, Africa is a is a very, very serious and important problem. But even in our, inside our own countries, we have some problems. Uh, here I put a graph for, for uh, US because we are in East Hampton, but I, I could have made a similar graph for, for France. Uh, the situation is uh, qualitatively the same, but quantitatively it's less problematic than in US. Uh, this picture and the previous one was taken uh, from the, a book of Thomas Piketty uh, called uh, Capital in the 21st Century. Uh, it's the best study. I'm sure you have heard about it. And I recommend the, the, the reading of this book. Uh, this chart uh, shows that the, the, ten, uh, the richest 10% 10 of uh, population in America uh, concentrates uh, half of the income of the, uh, the whole country. Uh, I didn't find on the internet um, when I prepared this talk the, the similar graphic for not for income, salaries, but uh, for capital. Uh, but I remember when I read the, the book, the situation was, uh, was even more um, problematic because the, ten, the, the, the richest 10% of uh, American uh, own more than 70% of the capital. And, uh, Piketty and other uh, projections show that it will certainly lead to 90% in a few decades. So 10% people uh, concentrating 90% of uh, the capital of a country is not as sustainable. Uh, and as we are in a democratic uh, society, it's not obvious that people will accept it for a long time. So maybe we should also uh, work uh, on economical and social issues uh, in our countries and also at a global uh, level. So I will. I would like to 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 come back to something that has been already addressed during this week, is uh, the emotional and the rational aspects of uh, uh, sustainable development education. Uh, to my opinion, uh, sustainable development education has to be made at school. It's not obvious. Uh, school is not, is not the only place where children learn things. They learn a lot outside of the school, and maybe more than they learn in, in the school. But um, for environmental, economical, and social issues, but mostly environmental issues, uh, Children are already uh, concerned and, and aware of the big issues. I mean, it's difficult to find a child in, uh, in France, a 10 years old uh, child, who is not aware of uh, the fact that the global temperature is increasing, uh, the biodiversity uh, uh, is in danger, and so on. It's very difficult to find such a child who is completely ignorant of these issues. Uh, because um, children are almost uh, saturated, they are very much exposed and almost saturated by uh, messages, uh, images, photos, but also articles in the media, 
um, a newspaper, the, on the internet, even in movies, even in movies for children or, or uh, cartoons. Uh, so th these issues are present, but most of the time, 99% of the time, I should say, um, uh, the, the, the focus is completely made on the emotional aspect. Uh, so uh, I don't mean that emotion is not important. We have seen uh, uh, during all the week the, the, the importance of emotion, and I just tell. Uh, I just spoke a few minutes ago about the importance of the emotional aspect on the emergence of our environmentalism movement. So I, I don't want to minimize the role of emotion. And, and we know uh, from uh, cognitive science the, the, the importance of emotion for the, the motivation, for the learning, and, et cetera. But uh, to my opinion, it is dangerous to focus only on this emotional aspect. Emotional aspect can motivate people to act but it doesn't help them to act properly. And if we want uh, our citizens to act properly and to make the good choice, uh, we have to help them uh, to, to have an, an evidence-based knowledge of the problems. And so that uh, it has something to do with science education. And science education, this is a role of, uh, of the school to, to, to provide it with children. Uh, so I, I'd like to to take a few minutes to speak about uh, the adventure of uh, the Maharapat. Uh, Twenty years ago in France, uh, we remarked that almost no children were practicing any science activity at school. There have been a lot of uh, investigations uh, around that, but only 3% of the primary school teachers did actually teach science 20 years ago. It's, it's not because the science were not in the curriculum. Science were, science were present, science was compulsory, it was in the curriculum, but in the fact there were no science education. And no, almost no science education, but when it was the case, in only 3%, it was only biology and, and with a very vertical approach of education. So it, people heard about science, but they didn't do science. And uh, this, this has been observed in a lot of developed countries. Uh, so uh, someone like uh, Leon Lederman, for example, a uh, Nobel Prize of, uh, of Physics in 1992, uh, commonly with, with uh, George Sarpak, Leon Lederman um, created an operation uh, in Chicago called Hands On. Uh, the purpose was to, to help uh, to struggle the, the, the social uh, difficulties in the ghetto of, uh, of Chicago. And he believed that science has something to do with that because uh, science is universal, because science uh, needs to, um, uh, scientific activity developed the, the sense of uh, dialogue, etc., etc. And uh, um, a delegation of uh, French Academy of Science, uh, led by Georges Harpac, but also with Pierre Lena, who is uh, present here, and you know him very well now. Uh, Pierre Lena and Yves Kéré uh, visited the hands-on operation uh, in Chicago and uh, were seduced by this operation. So there, there has been a decision 20 years ago to, to launch something similar to hands-on uh, in France, and it has been called La Main à la Patte because La Main à la Patte is a di direct translation of hands-on. To mettre la main à la patte in French means to put hands-on. So this is the direct translation. Uh, so, so the purpose of, of la main à la patte is to help enhance the, 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 the teaching of science and the quality of uh, this uh, science education. Uh, when, when I speak of science, uh, of course I mean science and technology, but uh, it's... Uh, Shortcut. Okay. Uh, the difficulty was in France and maybe uh, in a lot of countries that uh, most of the primary school teachers uh, don't doesn't have any scientific background. Uh, they came from literary course for more than eighty percent of them in, in France at least, and so they are afraid of doing science because they think that science is reserved to specialists. Uh, we spoke about it uh, this morning with Gonzalo, I remember. Uh, this is quite strange because um, 
in, in the French educational system, there is a unique professor for primary uh, school and kindergarten, so he teaches all the disciplines. And the primary school teachers are not uh, linguists, but they, they, they teach uh, French. They are not mathematicians, and they teach math. They are not artists, but they teach music or, uh, or painting. But there is something special with science, so that they consider that to teach science, you have to be a scientist. This is really strange. Uh, it has something to do with a, a growing distance between science and, uh, let's say, citizens. So the, 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 the work of La Main à la Pâte, uh, since the last 20 years, has to, to, to convince, to seduce teachers, uh, to convince them that science is not so difficult, that science is, is interesting, even if you're not a scientist. And so we, we, we had made some progress uh, during the, the last 20 years. Um, now the, the situation, 20 years after, we passed from 3% of teachers doing science to approximately 40 to 50% uh, teachers doing science. So it's quite good, but there are still a lot, of, a lot to do. Uh, we, are, we have reached half of our objective. Um, the pedagogical vision of la main à la patte uh, is something that has not been invented by la main à la patte. I mean, uh, la main à la patte promotes active pedagogy that has been uh, proposed before uh, in the footsteps of Freinet or Vygotsky or Piaget, etc., etc. Uh, the basic idea is that science has not to be taught as a, a fixed set of statement to, to be learned by art, but as an activity. Science is not something to, to, to learn, it's an activity to practice. This is, I, I think, the, the, the biggest idea in La Malapat philosophy. But, uh, so it's, a, it's an activity, and this activity is an inquiry, an investigation. Uh, and this is an inquiry that pupils have to do by themselves. Uh, it's not only to look at the teacher doing science, it's to do science by yourself. So, uh, to illustrate this approach, I will show you a small, a small movie taken in a six, um, six years old class, so grade one for, uh, for your system. But before, just a few words. So, the emphasis in La Malapat uh, view of uh, science education is put on the interrogation. The experiment is very important, observation too, but I think the most important is uh, in question. So the pupils have to formulate hypotheses to confront them to the real world by experimenting or observing, for example. Um, and, and they have to share what they have learned, what, what they have done to interpret and to reach a consensus to build something common. And of course, they have to check after that with the help of the, ch uh, of the teacher that what they have learned is not too far from uh, uh, what the scientific community says. Okay, so let, let me just uh, present you the, 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 this movie. Um, so keep in mind that it's uh, in a very small uh, level. It's grade one with the children of six years old. And if you listen to the minister uh, to the Ministry of Education, basically. Six years old children are just able to uh, learn uh, reading and writing. But here you, you will know that they, they are able also to reason. Uh, so the, the problem is uh, in the class, in the, the context in the class, is that the class has a mouse. And the mouse is called Mimi. Uh, why not? Uh, and uh, they have read a story about mouse uh, in a labyrinth, so they want to build a labyrinth for Mimi because it's funny. And the question uh, that will arise, and that will rise, is how does Mimi find a way through the labyrinth? And they will remark that Mimi will increase your performance step by step. But the reason is why? Uh, how does she learn? Is it because of its memory? Is it because of uh, her sense of smell, for example? And so they, they will question, and they will make a very nice experiment to check uh, that. So I, I put you this more.
après avoir écouté une histoire, on s'est demandé que ferait Mimi dans un labyrinthe. Mais au juste, c'est quoi un labyrinthe On a essayé d'en dessiner. Il en résoudre de toutes sortes. On en a inventé sur papier. Ou sur l'ordinateur. Ensuite, on s'est mis d'accord pour en choisir un pour en aller construire. Oh, ah, c'est bien ça, la pirate Ah, ouais, Mimi, elle doit me prendre. Moi, j'aimerais que toi, être à la place de Mimi, il faut que tu le fasses. On s'en fout. Mais non Mais si Tous les jours, on a mis Mimi dans le labyrinthe. On l'a filmé. On l'a chronométré. Pour lui donner moins à manger pour qu'elle trouve vite la nourriture à la sortie. Thank you for Mimi. Uh, this video impresses me so much. Each time I, I, I see it, uh, we, we forget the age of the children. I mean, six years old is very impressive. And uh, it shows us that we can trust the children. We can, we can trust them to, to follow a rational path. I mean, just not to, to be excited and so on, but to have a rational thinking. And uh, this thinking is driven by curiosity. They really want to know what happened to Mimi. And there is an emotional, uh, uh, of course, uh, involvement in, uh, in this animal. But really, the, the, this, the, the addition of emotion and uh, reason that is efficient here. Yeah. Uh, of course, uh, they, they can't do that alone. 
Uh, if you just put a mouse in the middle of uh, 25, uh, six years old children, you will have some problem. I, I, I wouldn't like to be the mouse at this moment. <laughs> but but uh, so the, the, the teachers have a very important role to play, but it's a subtle role. I mean, uh, the, as you, you have seen, the, the, the teacher doesn't give any answer. Uh, the only thing that is doing the teacher is to ask questions. And when there is a problem, the teacher asks new questions. He helps them to reformulate. He, he forces them to argue. He forces them to discuss with each other, to, uh, to listen to each other, etc., etc. And uh, the, the, the benefits uh, we, uh, we expect from such a pedagogical method are very important. I mean, uh, first of all, maybe to my opinion, the most important one is that uh, the children have to confront the hypothesis to the real world. Uh, and they have to accept it uh, by experimenting, by observing, and the, world, the real world resists to them. Uh, they have to accept it even if the experience goes in a way that is contrary to their first representation and to their will. They have to accept it. And to, to, to my opinion, it's very important for uh, when we are studying, uh, uh, when we are doing uh, sustainable development projects. And uh, the real world resists to our will, okay? Um, and uh, it helps also to, to, to develop uh, critical thinking, a sense of dialogue. Uh, they realize that it's better to reach a consensus than to impose it, uh, his own ideas. Um, see, this is why I think uh, we, we should have, uh, we should put the stress on the active pedagogy and particularly hands-on activities for sustainable development projects. Because once again, uh, we are not here to, to, to make people become activists. We are, not, we are here to help them to, to become citizens and to make choices and to help them to make rational choices. Okay? So, once again, uh, ethics uh, has to be added to these uh, scientific uh, activities. But I will only speak about science because uh, I'm not expert at all in, uh, in ethics. But, uh, uh, Ms. Dr. Kozumi or Professor Lena could, could, could speak better than me about these issues. And from this process of discovery to be efficient, we think that it's best, it's better to, to start from the direct environment of the child. Uh, because he, he will have to confront his representation, his ideas. It's better to start with, from what he knows or what he thinks he knows. Uh, it means that uh, when we are dealing with uh, global issues, we can we can study global issues, and we have to do it even at primary school. But uh, maybe it's better to start with local issues, to experiment, to observe, etc., to manipulate at a local scale, lo uh, a small scale and a short uh, scale also also short in time. I mean, uh, in the school you can't manipulate at a large scale at, uh, on, on long term. You're only manipulating, observing. Uh, experimenting at small scale and short term. So we have to do that first, and after that, thanks to other tools like uh, simulation, modelization, document studies, and so on, we will be able to pass from the short term and small scale to large scale and long term, okay? Um, but we, so we use uh, new technology, simulation, and so on, but, um, as much, uh, as often as we can, we try to, uh, to manipulate and to confront the, the, the pupils with a real world, okay? To put really hands on. Uh, now, I, um, I would like to give you a, an example of an educational program we have built for sustainable uh, development. Uh, the subject is about uh, ecological housing. At first, I would like to present you a, a project on climate change, but as we have so much spoken about climate change, I decided to speak about something that is connected to the climate change uh, problematic, but not climate change, because there is other issues uh, to be studied than only climate change. Uh, just keep in mind before going into detail in this project that this project has been designed uh, not for one class or even not for one school, but for all the classes, all the schools in France. I mean, it's very important 
uh, because Lama La Pat has a national mission. It's not, uh, uh, we are not depending on a school. And uh, we, we want this kind of project to disseminate as much as possible. And uh, for that purpose, we have to, to take into account the fact that most of the teachers doesn't have any scientific background in, in France. Most of the primary school teachers uh, come from literary courses, I, I, I said. So we have to make really turnkey projects with um, provide all the scientific background and so on. And we have also to, to build modular projects. I mean, some, uh, some teachers will only spend two or three weeks on such a project, but other teachers will, will agree to, sp to, to spend three or even four months on such a project. So we have to build something more turnkey and modular, which is not so easy. It could be a little bit, uh, it could seem to be a contradiction, but we, we, we try to do that. To do that. And uh, as we want this kind of project to disseminate as much as possible, we have also to take into account the fact that we are in real normal school. I mean, not Ross Institute. Uh, the, the real public school in France doesn't have uh, any resource. They don't have uh, material. The most complicated material that is present in a school in France is a thermometer. And, and I can assure you that very often I came to schools where there is no a single thermometer for the whole school. It happens very often. So we have to keep that in mind and to build pedagogical projects that are scientifically ambitious, but that don't need any specific material. There is another reason why we, we think it's better not to use very high-tech, sophisticated, and expensive material, is that this kind of material sometimes act as a black box. And we don't want a uh, black box because we want the pupils to understand the complete process from the A to Z. And uh, so basically, we'd like them to use material they should be able to build by themselves. So thermometer is the most complicated material we use. And we are able to, to create, to build a thermometer in, in, in school. Um, so this project is about Ecological housing, it's a multidisciplinary project with the science, with technology, with mathematics, geography, history, uh, civic education, ICT, and so on. Uh, it has been launched four years ago, and uh, it has such a good impact because uh, here we can see that uh, approximately uh, 13,000 classes have made this project. So some of the classes have spent three weeks on the project. Three weeks, basically, uh, French teachers spend uh, two sessions per week. One session is one hour, typically. Uh, so, so some of the teachers have made six, seven uh, lessons, but some of them have made 20, 30 uh, sessions for, for, this, uh, for this project. And the average is around uh, 15. But 13,000 classes doing, in average, 15, 15 sessions on this topic, it's quite a good result, and you will see that even if such a, project, such a project is costly, when we compare it to the impact, it's really uh, economically efficient. So the project starts with uh, the, the question is, why do we build houses? The purpose have to describe uh, what kind of house they, they would like to live in, and the sharing highlights some functions that are even uh, um, every time present in the description of the children, so vital uh, functionalities of uh, of houses and some more optional functionalities. But after the kind of work, they will uh, make a study in uh, history and geography because they will study documents to compare the different forms of housing today in the world and also through the history. And they will study how the needs of the, the human beings have evolved uh, here um, in France at least. Today, we don't build house to protect ourselves from the predators. It's not the, the reason we built house, but uh, in the past it should have been. So the, the, the needs have evolved, the material have evolved, the techniques have evolved. So of course the housing, uh, the houses and buildings have evolved through the history. And there is, they will realize that there is today a wide variety, a diversity of, uh, of um, housing in, in the world and also a wide variety 
uh, through the history. So in France today, uh, in many parts of the year, we have rural, urban uh, habitations, uh, individual, collective. We have housing made of concrete, of wood, of stone, of mud, whatsoever. And, and then we remark that there is a contradiction between this variety of housing, of houses, and the, the complete homogeneity of what we are building now. In France today, 80% of the new constructions are completely uh, the same. I mean, individual houses, suburban, and made of concrete. So it's, it's a contrast between uh, with the variety, the historical and geographical variety. And so the next step is how to study the impact on these different forms of housing on the environment, typically. Uh, the works begin, begin by kind of a role play called uh, the, the, the game of inequalities or the game uh, of chairs. It's not the game of thrones, but it could be uh, the game of chairs because uh, you, you, you will see it. Um, because uh, in this game, the purpose have to, to divide into different groups, each group representing a continent. But for the needs of the activity, we divide North and South America into two, two different uh, uh, continents, but it's not important. And um, they have to, to, to divide themselves according to the real population diversity uh, repartition uh, in these regions. <laughs> And after that, they have to share some resources, like, uh, for example, water or money, uh, let's say a GPD, according to the real repartition of the world. And uh, uh, they will also uh, share uh, and see how uh, are reported um, uh, things like uh, greenhouse gas emissions, for example, or energy resources, and so on. And this kind of activity is, is interesting because they will fill with their body uh, some information that otherwise should remain very abstract for them. When you, when you say to a nine years old child, 80% of the population is in this region, it doesn't mean anything to him. It's very abstract. But here, you can see uh, what, what it means in the class. And uh, for the GPD, for example, the GPD are represented by the, the, the chairs. So uh, uh, here, they, re they will remark that uh, in Europe, for example, there are only two people but they have six chairs, so they can make what they want. They can uh, sit down, they can lie down the chairs. But in Africa, there are not two, but four people, but only one, one chair. And during the whole session, they only have one chair for four people. So they can stand. Uh, they are obliged to stand. They can't sit. And so they will deeply uh, feel uh, this impression of inequality. We do the same with uh, water resources and so on and so on. And uh, there is another uh, reason why I like this kind of activity is that it helps, t uh, it helps students to think uh, about the difference of uh, a data and a data per capita. For example, if you speak about greenhouse gas emissions, uh, we, al we always uh, here that uh, China is the most important uh, source of uh, greenhouse gas, etc. But if you compare the emissions per capita, uh, there is something very different that appears, is that European and um, American, especially in North uh, America, uh, are the, the most important uh, source of uh, emissions, of course. Uh, so this kind of activity helps us to, to after that, to, to discuss about the, the actual context. I mean, uh, on one hand, the increasing population, and especially in Africa for the next century. And on the other end, the climate change, will, and both uh, of these uh, phenomena uh, will tend to uh, increase the inequalities. So at the end of such activities, uh, we are aware of the need to save energy and to save water. And now uh, all our uh, work, uh, all our further work in the class is how to build houses that are water efficient or energy efficient. Uh, so this is an example of how we can also work in mathematics for such an activity, but okay. So they will begin by studying uh, material, uh, with studying documents and uh, studying the life cycle of each material, I mean concrete, for example, or wood or mud or stone. And they will, uh, after that, uh, 
realized that there are strong differences in, um, in the environmental consequences of using uh, concrete or, or wood, for example, or mud. After that, they will realize that it is possible to build something strong even if it's not made of concrete. Uh, so here in the class, we give some materials uh, to, the, to, to the children, and they, have, they are completely autonomous. They are not guided at all. The, the, the question, uh, the, what they have to do is to build a, a, a portion of, uh, of a wall. Uh, they have two or three hours to do that. And so they will experiment, they will, they will fail, they will, uh, they will experiment, experiment again and with trials and errors. They will, by themselves, rediscover the different techniques uh, that are uh, useful for making concrete, for example, uh, a wattle and daub, and air rent earth. So once again, we, we can trust the imagination and the rationality of uh, children to to achieve this kind of task. Um, the next step is, okay, we have built our house now uh, with the, this kind of material, how to make it uh, en uh, energy efficient? Uh, the first, basically the first idea of the children is to, to insulate the, the house, but they, they know the word insulator, but they don't know what, what, what it does mean. So we are doing a lot of experiments of a role of insulator, and so that they can, they can understand what's behind this world. And also, uh, they will make a document study to, to know uh, what part of the house has to be insulated uh, in priority, and also what are the different in, uh, available insula insulators, and what are the ecological friendly insulators. Uh, another way to think uh, about the efficiency uh, the energy efficiency is to try to use as much as possible uh, the, the free uh, solar energy that comes to us. So we, you can work on the orientation of the house to make some experiment on that. I don't show anything, I just show a few, few examples of the activities. Uh, here they, they, want to, they want to heat their house uh, thanks to solar energy, so they, they want to build a water heater. So the question is how to make a very efficient water heater. So they have to separate all the parameters uh, they, they think about. Uh, for example, um, does the material of the container have an influence of the, 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 the efficiency of the, of the water heater? Uh, do we need a cover or not? Or if yes, is it a translucent cover or not? Uh, does the color of uh, the device uh, play a role or not? Uh, the shape? Is the surface important? For example, it's, indeed, it's very important, the, the, the surface. Um, or the, um, the volume, etc., cetera, et cetera. Uh, After that, when they have studied all the different parameters separately, they will gather all the information, and they are able now to build something very efficient uh, by their hands uh, with very low-tech uh, very low-tech uh, material here. And uh, it's very efficient. In March in Paris, uh, Paris is not in the tropics. Huh? In March in Paris, we have reached uh, between 50 and 60 degrees, depending on the groups. Uh, each group had, has its own water heater. So it's very efficient, and they were very proud of their result. Um, so at this stage, uh, we have a, a work on uh, water efficiency, etc. but I don't have time to, to, to talk about it, so I'll skip it. And uh, much more interesting for me is, uh, because it's related to mathematics, is uh, the, how we can compare the efficiency of houses and flats and apartments. And this is connected to geometry. Uh, the, the purpose they have is to imagine uh, different ways of lodging, let's say, 12 families. So they can build, uh, they can build uh, 12, sorry, separated houses here or a single building here, or different other propositions. And each time they have to investigate the, vol the total volume, which remains obviously for us uh, the same. Uh, it's 12 times the volume of a cube. Uh, but uh, it's a surprise for them. The surface changed a lot. And, but uh, for this kind of uh, children, uh, if the volume is the same, the surface is the same. It's really a surprise for us, for them to, to to see that the surface and volume can change uh, uh, separately. 
And so uh, the total amount of face, uh, faces you have here uh, tells you about the total amount of walls and roofs you have to build, so the total amount of material you have to use. And there is something much more important, uh, is the, the, the surface in contact with the external air. And this has something to do with the uh, energy, uh, energy efficiency. Uh, at this point, it's much more an intuition than a, an, an evidence. But they will make an experiment after that to confirm this, in, this intuition. It's a very simple experiment. Let's say you, 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 you take uh, hot water, the same amount of water, the same temperature, of course, and you put it in the two separate uh, recipients, uh, one very compact and one uh, which will ensure a large surface of contact with the air. And the result is spectacular. It's a very low-tech and very simple in, and a trivial experiment, but the result is spectacular. And in a few minutes, we have 20 degrees of difference between the two, um, the, in the two cases. If you have made a, such an experiment with isolated or not isolated, you should have two, three, four degrees differences. Here, 20 degrees. And in fact, in reality, uh, uh, architects now, uh, that uh, geometry is much more important for efficiency, for energetic efficiency, than is, is isolation. Uh, I will not have time to, to detail this, but the, the end of the project is about urbanism and how to transform not the houses but the cities uh, to become ecological friendly. We talk about, we talk about uh, water, waste, transportation, uh, and of course uh, houses inside. And so in order to, to, to allow uh, the large-scale diffusion of such a project, we provide <coughs> teachers with a turnkey teaching guide uh, which is very detailed and, and contains uh, detailed session, assessment protocols, uh, document for the studies. We also provide them with a conceptual scenario as a, uh, of a project in order for the teacher to, to realize that uh, such a project is not uh, a succession of activities, but an organization of concepts. So they can make their own project. Uh, it helps them to, to personalize the project. They will see uh, very, uh, very quickly here that some sessions are completely compulsory and some are not because the concept doesn't, is not necessary for uh, achieving a new concept, for example. This is very helpful for the modular uh, activity. Uh, we provide them with a lot of documentation. Uh, producing such a project is, is a lot of work. I mean, uh, um, this project I, I have been coordinating uh, I, I have been co coordinating this project. So basically, there are approximately uh, 50, uh, 60 people working on such a project, the, the authors of the project, of course, but also scientific and pedagogical consultants. Let's say engineers, scientists, architects, geographs, uh, historians, for, for example, but also a large amount of uh, teachers and observers who go to class to test it and to observe what happened. So it's quite a large process. Uh, the, the, the cost for such a project for us is uh, between, depending on the project, is between 200 and uh, 300,000 euros uh, when we can take into account all the costs and the salaries of people working in, etc. But we, um, if, we, we, if we take into account the fact that the diffusion is at, at a very large scale, basically the cost for having one class so 25 t uh, children working during two months on this topic, the cost is 20 euros. So it's quite uh, economically efficient. We provide uh, them also with multimedia animation, we, uh, animations we have produced in order to, uh, but to change the scale, to pass to large scale or to long term uh, investigation. So it's, it's very modest, but uh, it's enough for primary school uh, and lower secondary school. And a collaborative website uh, that, of course, give access to the resource for free. Everything is, just, everything is available for free. The pedagogical module, even the paper guide, is distributed for free. Uh, the, the website is on free access. Uh, there are animations, of course, but also a lot of community tools uh, like forums, blogs, uh, interactive map. I don't have the, uh, the illustration is on the next slide. Uh, because we, we want classes to, to build like a, a community about around the, the, the sustainable development activities. So they can exchange, they can help, they can challenge each other, etc. And so the dissemination of such a project is quite good. Of course, 
this project has not been translated into any language except French. So, so of course, it's basically in French-spoken countries when, where, where it is set up. But um, it's, quite, it's quite a good diffusion. And just for this project, we have also made a training session. So uh, uh, approximately 4,000 teachers have been specifically trained on this project. <coughs> Uh, and depending on the other project, you can reach uh, 10,000 trained teachers and uh, 25,000 classes involved. So this is very important for us because we remarked that uh, the number of teachers doing science were increasing, uh, was increasing thanks to this kind of project because it's not a science, science project. As, you, as we have seen, uh, a lot of teachers fear to teach science, but they don't fear to teach uh, sustainable development. So they don't know that they will do a lot of science, so they, they jump into the project, and after that they, they realize that they are able to do science. So for us it's very important. So the first, it's a chronological order, so the first pro project we have produced is called Living with the Sun. Um, it has been translated into a few languages, but unfortunately not English. It's about uh, the dangers of sun overexposure. So it's a health educational program. Uh, the second one, and maybe the most successful one, was uh, the project uh, about climate change uh, called The Climate by Planet and I. Uh, after this project, a lot of teachers have said, OK, we have worked on climate change. Now we would like a new project dedicated to the solutions, and not to study the problem, but to study the solution. So this is, this is why we have produced this project on ecological housing. Uh, and we have also produced a project on transportation, which is very, transportation and housing is very two key aspects for limiting uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, another project which is very nice, it's a health educational program about nutrition. Uh, this project also uh, for biodiversity, so these are issues that you really well know. Uh, and maybe a much more uh, original one about uh, the, it's an educational program about natural disasters. Uh, the focus is made on volcanoes, uh, earthquakes and tsunamis. Uh, it is currently to be translated into a few languages, uh, German, Spanish and English, but it's not yet finished. And uh, maybe the most original one, uh, it's not really uh, sustainable development, but as it includes a little bit of health education, I, I put it here, uh, this project is very ambitious. It's, it is called the Screens, the Brain and the Child. And we have a small discussion with uh, Hideaki Kozumi and Pierlena about this project. The purpose of this project at first was to make health education to prevent children uh, for the, uh, to, to, to be, um, Addiction, this is the word that I was looking for, sorry. It was a project for preventing screen addictions, but step by step, it has become a much more ambitious project. And now uh, the project, we think it helps teachers and children to understand a little bit the, the, the functioning of uh, their brain, uh, emotion, cognition, memory, uh, attention, etc., etc. a lot of co uh, cognitive functions. Uh, and the way you, the usage of screen will, uh, will interfere or not with these functions. So it's a very uh, uh, interesting project. And uh, now our future project, uh, I am an Ecomobile, the launch of this project is next, next week. So after, this, uh, after this, um, this workshop, I come back to Paris and I launch this project. I'm, I've been working on since two years. Uh, this is a project about ecological transportation because, as you know, transports are very, very important, uh, a very important source of greenhouse gas. So if we want to limit climate change, uh, we have to, uh, to change our way to construct houses, but also to transport ourselves. And uh, we, we start a new project that will, uh, uh, on which we will work during uh, at least one year. Uh, um, again, is the, the ocean, my planet, and I, and the project has three, three dimensions. The, the mechanism of oceans, uh, the circulation of water, the acidity of water, etc. a lot of things uh, like that, the climate change and so on. Uh, the, the ocean has a, um, 
um, a host for living species, the ecosystem and so on. And the last part is the relationship between humans and oceans. Uh, everything we take from the oceans, in, w in what sense we need oceans to live, but also the consequences and uh, the sometimes un unsustainability uh, of our actions uh, related to the oceans. Well, that's all. Thank you. Thank you.